Just a quick note, the video has some lag in this episode. I didn't want to re-record it since we got the audio and that's the most important part. So just wanted to give you a heads up that the video will have some latency. It won't be very fluid like our other episodes, but in terms of alpha, in terms of delivering real value that you can take and apply for your own business, it's right up there with the best of them. So without further ado, on to the show. Welcome everyone, excited to have CT on the show today. CT is the founder, CEO of Engage Rocket, an EdTech SaaS company that recently raised the Series A round. CT, welcome on the show. Hey Chris, thanks for having me. My name is Chitong or CT, right? And it's, CT is much easier for, for many, even where I'm from in Singapore. <laughs> I'm an economist turned entrepreneur. I've uh, been studying the organizational psychology space for almost 15 years now in a very practical way. Um, and prior to founding Engage Rocket, so my co-founder and I were at uh, an organization called Gallup. Uh, what it does is it does organizational analytics for Fortune 500 companies. You might be familiar, some of you might be familiar in the past, there used to be this USA Today Gallup poll. And then they, they kind of stopped that part of the business um, in 2012. But they applied the same science of uh, polling and, and, and survey research to uncovering uh, very unusual things within organizations that could help leaders to be able to lead their teams better. And so we started Engage Rocket off having that experience out in Singapore and we kind of grew the company in Asia. In in Asia today, the company mostly deals still with, with HR uh, and HR teams within mid to large enterprises. Since then, I've moved to the US uh, and it has, you know, I'm, I'm in California and we work primarily actually with school districts, so public schools, and we run a different type of analytics for them. And it's it's quite a different business, quite a different uh, go-to-market motion, quite a different, I, I guess, even product. What it does have is that fundamentals in organizational research, uh, psychology, and how that applies to teachers, students, families, uh, and the community. So that, that's something that we're helping school districts in the US to get a handle on and make better data-driven decisions uh, on. Got it. I know uh, as part of your growth journey, building this company, uh, you've conducted a lot of different interviews with your customers. Most startups start with uh, 10 to 20 interviews and they get they use that to get inside the mind of their customers and then they move on. Um, but with Engage Rocket, you'd never stop learning. You never stop digging and running that customer discovery. Before the meeting, before the recording, we, uh, we talked and you mentioned 280 some interviews that you've recorded so far to learn more about your customers, their pains, but maybe talk a little bit more about that. You know, can you talk about your experience running these interviews and some of the insights you've had as a result of conducting them? Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that made us run so many interviews is because I, I think classic literature, if you go back to Steve Blank and Four, four Steps of the Epiphany, you know, 20 interviews, that's great. And that's provided that you already know your ideal customer profile. And then you, you just basically keep hitting uh, that profile and you get 20 interviews, you get tons of insight on them. In, in my case, I think it was slightly different because coming into a new market uh, in a way that was not that was not very similar at all to the market that I was expanding out of in Asia. The whole process of finding product market fit had to begin from scratch. And so getting like speaking to some hypothesized ICP or ideal customer profiles to begin with was was critical. So we, we had those 20, 20 some interviews um, with at that time HR leaders and and you know we learned a lot from those HR leaders. Like what are the problems that they're solving? What are the what are some of the critical uh, things that they need to solve on a day to day basis? How do they use existing tools or you know Google Sheets or Excel spreadsheets to be able to solve them? I think over time what we learned was that our product didn't quite solve those problems for or, or as well as their existing solutions for the HR community. However, after you know. We, we went quite some time uh, through that product market fit cave, you know. We finally saw that light at the end of the tunnel where speaking to basically a K-12 ed educator, sharing about some of the challenges that they faced with 
teacher retention, the teacher engagement, the kind of work that they are doing on the job, being able to evaluate the success of all the different programs that they're running in terms of student uh, social emotional learning, in terms of student academic outcomes, um, and how all of this was critical within the public education space in being able to retain st- student enrollment, which drives revenue for for public schools, and suddenly that that all kind of fit. Not only did we find a clear line of sight from what we did uh, to what mattered for our customers, it also mattered strategically because you know we're we're in this what I call a Netflix moment for public education where now the, there's a, an abundance of choice for students, uh, for families to be able to choose whether they want to homeschool their kids, whether they want to send their kids to private school, uh, whether they want to send their kids to charter school, or what you know, a religious institution. And more and more states are now funding these choices using public funds. And so public schools are now in this situation where, oh no, we have to be a lot more innovative. We have to be a lot more creative about how we're competing for students. And being able to implement more innovative processes internally and evaluate the outcomes on their their students in terms of the achievements uh, and be able to report that to the board, report that to communities, report that to families, that is spot on like what we're trying to solve. Amazing. Amazing. Are there, so it gave you a very clear line of sight into who your ideal customer is. It sounds like some of their uh, major pain points. It also sounds like uh, there's some market messaging and some copy, some copywriting that came from it uh, in terms of uh, how, how you can help teachers, uh, school districts better position their offer and make a case for uh, student enrollment and retention, if I heard correctly. Maybe are there more downstream impacts from conducting those 280 plus interviews that have really served to help you understand your customer and grow your business? You never lose talking to customers as a, as a founder. One of the things that was critical to me was we have obviously a smaller number of customers than the number of people we've spoken to, but to be able to really bring value to the customers that, that we have, that the paying customers that we do have, using insights that we've learned from all of these other conversations really helps us to sharpen our offering, sharpen the, va- sharpen the value proposition, and and deliver value to our existing customer. Um, at the same time, it also gives us a much deeper understanding of the nature of the problems that they're they're trying to address. And everything that I've art- articulated in this call, I did not know this three months ago. I couldn't string this this problem together, but but through these conversations, it's really just pattern recognition. You know, you, you go through that many conversations and you realize these are things that resonate. These are things that matter to the customer. And then translating that into, you know, obviously like sales copy and, and, and you know, the pitch, um, translating that into the delivery of the product even and how the customer experiences the product. Um, that That's all part of the process. And ultimately... When, when you think about it, we're talking to a good eight to 10 district superintendents every week. No, Very few other organizations or individuals I know would have that level of, and that volume of interactions with, with public school leaders nationwide on a daily basis. That makes us, within our tiny little niche, it makes us a little bit of an expert that we can then generate content around, which is then consumed um, by by our target market and hopefully brings value to them already and introduces them to the brand and builds trust because we, we've, we've gone through the hard work of building this content uh, already. And so, you know, it creates a separate flywheel uh, that we can then leverage uh, down downstream. And there's, you just can't lose, right? Talking to customers at this volume. I should also mention that a, side, a, a, a very unintended side effect of doing all of this and putting it into a podcast was we now have 280 podcasts 280 some podcasts running around on Spotify, Apple, and so on. And because of that, we we're now one of the top 10% out of 3.4 million shows out there. Uh, and it's the engaging leadership show. Please feel free. I'm going to give it a little plug. Check it out. Um, yeah, you know, 280 episodes in where we, we never intended for it to be a top 10% podcast, but now it is. Amazing. Engaging leadership show. Uh, So everyone go check that out. For the growth marketers and growth oriented founders listening to this, how would you recommend CT that anyone goes out and starts their own 
uh, media brand or their own their own way of um, running these interviews to learn more about their customers and really get into their minds and understand deeply uh, more than their competitors or maybe anyone else in their market how their uh, ideal customers think, feel, and behave. So one of the first things that I would recommend uh, is really to to pick one medium that you're good at. So this could be social media or whatever. One medium that you're good at that your customers also live in. And even then, it's not not hundred percent necessary that your customers live in, because I realize that many educators didn't listen to podcasts before this, but now they do. So you know, you never know. But pick a medium uh, and and choose one and and kind of focus on that. It it could either be in the past that used to be blog posts. So I would, I would write blog posts um, and in, interview people about blog posts and share share these insights with them. I get feedback from from what I've written. So that's another way of reaching out to someone. Uh, or you could use, you know, podcasts that are relatively straightforward, but, you know, there's a little bit of a lift in terms of understanding how you can produce it, how you can distribute it, uh, and so on. But, if, you know, once, once, you, once you commit to that me- medium, like just pick like six, right? Do six podcast episodes, do six blog posts, whatever it is. And what we did in, like when we started this whole project was to do cold outreach to our ICP and see who would respond, right? Like what's the response rate? So we tested out a whole bunch of different possible mediums. And uh, we, we actually found that uh, product input, like having somebody... Um, give us input on a prototype of whatever we're trying to build. Uh, that actually had pretty good responses. Like reports, uh, white papers about the industry also got pretty good responses and, and podcasts got pretty good uh, responses. So find something that works within your niche. And, and yeah, I mean, and, and just just go out there and talk to customers or, you know, failing which, just pick up the phone and, and dial. I mean, the first, first 20 superintendents that I spoke to was literally just calling Talking to the EA, saying, "Hey, you know, we we got a, uh, we got this show, which at that time had zero <laughs> guests, <laughs> and you know, we had to get through the communications teams and, and everybody else. And and then uh, now, obviously, it's much easier. You know, you, you're top ten percent podcast. You you you've got a little bit more clout entering that conversation. Um, but at the beginning, um, just pick up the phone, like do do things that don't scale, do things that others are not willing to do." Right? That's what you, that's what that that's what gets you through. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, do things uh, that don't scale and do things no one else wants to do. No one, very few people are energized by picking up the phone, but the conversations that it can unlock are real. I love that. I love that you uh, you tested cold outreach to get people to provide feedback and input to what you're building. You uh, offered up sample uh, white papers, reports, so things of value, uh, or maybe flattering them a little bit the interview or with um, with uh, soliciting feedback, just saying, hey, would love your input and your insight uh, on what we're building. Are there other growth stories or growth plays that you've put to use in the past few years that have helped you uh, build and scale this company? Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about COVID um, and, and the pandemic. And I, I, I use it, I mean, we're many years past that time, but I thought that that was one of the most successful growth hacks in the short term that, that we had where, you know, the moment we found that the lockdowns were going to happen, like people wouldn't be able to go to work, everyone's going to transition immediately, almost overnight from working in the office five days a week to working from home for goodness knows how long. Our pipeline and our new deals uh, <laughs> just went to zero for the foreseeable future. We had no idea what was gonna what's gonna happen and you know we sat with our our team and and we we're trying to figure out like okay what do we do right we had, we had all these marketers and salespeople that we knew would not be productive at all for the next at least two to three months because nothing's gonna happen like no one's buying anything and so we we, we made the decision at that, at that time to offer up the product for free and to use that as a means to help businesses navigate that transition to working from home and you know we did we did deliver value because we delivered the product they got a product for free they got good analytics on how their workforce was doing while they're working from home and what it gave us was really good aggregate data on what the whole country was doing um at at that time this was done like in a relatively small country in singapore but we had a monopoly on data 
now uh, on what the whole country was doing as they transitioned out. Uh, it was hyper relevant to the market. Even though we, we, we didn't immediately convert any of these sales, what it did do for us was it got us immediately a seat at the table in the two largest associations that were relevant to our profession. So we, we immediately got a seat at the table because if, if they wanted to be relevant as professional organizations, they had to be part of what we were doing. Uh, otherwise, they, you know, what are they doing, right? What else were they doing? So we got them in to, to, uh, as partners, and then that drove a huge amount of awareness, credibility, and so on. We were seeing some of the largest like Fortune 500 companies using our data in their, in their internal presentations. And we, we started seeing, you know, we'll have people taking screen like photos and sending it to me and say, hey, is this your data? I'm like, oh, wow, I, didn't, I had no idea it made it <laughs> into your boardroom, but, but that's great. Um, so we had a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of awareness and uh, it also got a lot of earned media attention. So we, were, we, 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 we thought that, okay, you know, we, we have all this information, maybe the press will want to pick it up. And so, you know, you, you go through the papers, you go through the, the, all the media sites, and then you, what we did was we looked for reporters that were writing about those topics that were relevant to what we would do. And then we just cold reached out to them and said, hey, you know, would you be interested in this data? Because nobody else, no one else has it. You, you want to write about it. And we got a whole bunch of uh, media coverage from there, which then had another, another flywheel. So each time, we, th this reporters now knew that we were good for what we were delivering. So the next time we had a, a, a an update, we just gave it to them and, and, and they'd, they'd publish it, which was great. And over time, we became this kind of trusted source uh, on anything within that space for them. And uh, that was, you know, over, just over the course of six months and it drove our pipeline uh, eventually massively. Like we, we had at one point in time, 127 customers that came from nothing, from zero. It just just appeared. So um, it was, yeah, I mean, that, that, it's kind of a long story, but uh, finding something that was hyper relevant to the market, um, delivering that uh, in spades, and then like maximizing the partnership opportunities, max maximizing the the media opportunities from that uh, was what I th what I think we did well at that time. Yeah, so you put really hyper relevant, interesting info out there, and then did cold outreach to these journalists, and then whenever you put out new data journalist pieces, you were already a familiar face. You could you could just message them and say, hey, we just published them, and. Uh, quite reliably see that they would uh, go ahead and uh, put that out there again um, and drive, like you said, 120 something new clients, not even leads or pipeline, new clients for you as a result of open sourcing this content. Incredible. That's so cool. Before this uh, recording, we were talking about how there's a treasure trove most companies don't use, which is their existing data, uh, some of the data they're already sitting on. I think you had mentioned that uh, you sat down one day and you were looking at your closed one data and you actually inferred that there was a new type of customer you could sell into, a whole entire new persona, different than the one you initially targeted and worked with. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit more about that experience, uh, the one where uh, you, you figured out you could double down on an entirely new sector to build your business. So that was the, the, the experience of us entering a new market in, in the US. And uh, there's a little bit of a product market fit uh, lesson in there where we were doing you know, we were talking to so many people and realizing that, you know, we're not quite fitting uh, the solution for what they're looking for, uh, with the exception of uh, one, like one conversation that we had in the K-12 education sector. And when that deal came through, we, 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 we asked what uh, Jim Kalbach uh, from the Jobs To Be Done book what he calls like a switch interview, right? So he just basically talked to the customer, like, why did you switch to us? And then he told us why. And there were two things that he mentioned, like two features uh, that he mentioned um, around, one was around the impact analysis that we do to connect survey data with uh, strategy. And the second one was around, was another feature that, that, was, that was more on the AI side uh, and how it processed open-ended text. And so 
to be really honest, like we've never even marketed these, or we never we never even talked about these these uh, features. We, this this was the trigger to us. Like, okay, oh my gosh, like we had these features for years, but we've just never never even thought that they were a selling point. And so we then started taking this to market um, by finding other people in the K twelve space to talk to and say, hey, is this useful at all, and why is it useful, and over time, not only did that help us build pipeline, it also helped us build a greater understanding of like why this is useful at all. And we have a lot more representative data right now, um, but you know we're seeing we're seeing a much better conversion rates across the board because we're now able to articulate exactly what a pro- what problem our product solves, um, and it, it's also informing product development because now we know specifically what that problem is. And we know how poorly it is solved, not just with the existing players in market. And obviously, you know, our product today like solves it decently well, but it's not like it it's not as good as it could be. And so like this is now like triggering product development and R and D that can help us to solve this problem a lot better and then you know ultimately grow the company and grow our customers, uh, deliver a better better product to our customers as well. So good. Uh, throughout this interview, you've mentioned uh, the Jim Callback, Steve Blank. So Jim Callback with Switch, uh, I think it's called Switch Interview, right? Uh, Steve Blank, Four Steps to Epiphany, uh, Paul Graham, Things That Don't Scale, uh, with the, uh, the, this one of his essays. Are there any other founders or practitioners of building, growing businesses, marketers, or just general resources that you've really, that you think back on a lot? that you reflect on uh, a lot as you grow this business and as you build up the team, as you bring on new customers and flesh out operations across all these different departments, any other major influences that, um, that have really had a big impact on you? I'm going to call out two that are in most recent memory. So one is Jason Lemkin uh, from Saster. Uh, he, he wrote uh, From Impossible to Inevitable. After reading that book, I was hooked on SaaS. Like I just... I felt like SaaS spoke to me as a business model. It's so interesting that almost the laws of SaaS are like the laws of physics. You run your business, and there are a lot of cre- there's a lot of creativity that you can have around how you structure your your business. But when it comes to uh, customer acquisition costs, when it comes to lifetime value, when it comes to uh, looking at your gross margins, there are just a few things that you really need to pay attention to in SaaS. And if you structure your business well, these things would all tell you that that is well structured, and you can keep you can reliably grow your business that way. So, so Jason Jason Lemkin really introduced that perspective to me, and then you know there are lots of others like Christoph Jans, Thomas Tungutz, also really really smart. Uh, uh, they, these are all really solid analysts of uh, of SaaS. And uh, there's another Substack that I, I I might be getting this wrong, but Jamie Bell. He, he writes uh, a Substack that does a really good analysis of public SaaS, uh, public SaaS companies. So I think there's like that whole category um, really makes a big difference to me. Another person I want to call out is uh, Rob Walling, uh, who literally wrote the SaaS playbook. He's a little bit more on the bootstrap SaaS side of the house, but I have mad respect for successful bootstrap SaaS companies. and. Yeah, the the creativity and the innovation that comes from the community that he runs, uh, MicroConf, to me like is an inspiration, uh, and and continues to to inform like how how I do business, how I think about problems. Yeah, I, I'm nothing if not scrappy. I think as a founder, uh, and and I, I I draw a lot of inspiration uh, from that community. Those are all OGs right there. Those names. It should be required reading for every founder or growth marketer at a B2B SaaS, for sure. Yeah, indie hackers or the bootstrappers. I think the even if you raise capital like you did, as PG says, you should still be very cash-minded, uh, conserving dollars, keeping the team small and lean, expanding only when it's absolutely necessary. I think these are principles that are uh, appropriate for any company, even uh, agnostic to whatever economy um, starts to unfold right now, any shifts, but... Uh, especially in a you know a bear market, they're doubly true, triply true. But I think that's uh, that's about it for this session, CT. I just want to point people to where they can connect with you. Uh, where can people find out more about you and what you're working on? 
Uh, so the best place to find me would be uh, www.engagingleadershipshow.com. Uh, so you'll find all of the content that we put together from those interviews. Uh, you know, I think it, the the content keeps getting better over and over uh, over time. Um, so if you want to find out a little bit more about the space that we're operating in, that's a good place to go. Or you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, if you search for Chitung, uh, C-H-E-E-T-U-N-G or C-T, um, you'll, you'll be able to find me. Uh, if you just type in like, uh, you, you, yeah, I think there's only one of me <laughs> with my weird name. But uh, yeah, that, that, those are probably the easiest ways to, to find me. Perfect. CT, thank you so much for coming on the show. You didn't hold back. And I appreciate you just sharing everything that's worked for you personally and growing this business. Uh, we'll have to get you back on. But uh, for the time being, thank you again. Thanks for coming on the show. It's a pleasure to be here.